I'm John Germillo, leadership coach and consultant in the Hartford area. Uh, this show is something that Marianne and I had put together after collaborating on a few projects, thinking about people in our network that kind of just intersect as creatives. So we wanted to get their stories, what drove them into their creative nature, their development, their refinement, and at the same time, learn about their fields, where they stand now, where they believe those fields and their creative nature, everything like that is, is going in the future and evolving. And today we are interviewing Cornell Thomas. So Cornell is a four-time author. He's an international speaker, a coach and creator of the Global Positivity Summit. Welcome. Thank you so much for having Cornell. me, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. So Cornell, for those that don't know you as well as I do, um, <laughs> Can you explain to them what your nature of your work is and just briefly describe a little bit about what you do? Uh, sure. So the phrase professional conversationalist is so long. So I just have to say speaker sometimes. But, but really what I do is I travel the world and share my story. I also work with corporations about team dynamics and team building mindset. So if you could just take an umbrella, the top of it would be mindset and then under the umbrella is positivity, gratitude, empathy, teamwork, all these other things uh, that have kind of been the theme of my life since playing basketball at 16 years old up until 24, then coaching basketball for 13 years and now doing what I'm doing now for the last uh, seven and a half. So Cordell, can you kind of walk us through what your creative process, what's the creative nature um, that just drives your work that you're current, currently doing now? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, for me, the creative work, the, the thing that drives me the most is my purpose. And outside of my family, my two kids, my wife, my purpose is to help people realize they have one. And that's been something that just drives me because I feel like there's so many people on this earth that feel like they're here just to kind of exist and consume and then pass on. And I always tell people, I did a TED talk about it last year, I always tell people there's a reason that you're here. I mean, just statistically, you have to understand that you're a miracle, <laughs> like you're a miracle to be even born. So I think that's the thing that really drives me. And my work, it's, it just depends on the arena. If I'm writing a book, uh, the thing that drives me to write a book is to know that there's someone out there that might need to to see to read it if it's doing a podcast it's the same thing someone might need to hear it if it's the positivity summits it's just getting a group of people that look different together and helping the world realize that we're all the same we're all bonded by this diversity so i do so many different things but the end of the day it's just my purpose that kind of drives me to do can you give a breakdown across the various i guess avenues that you use what is a brief walkthrough of what each avenue might be, how that looks like that you put it together, how do you create and then kind of put it out there for people to understand and see. Yeah. So anybody that is writing a book, I can walk you through my process and it's really a quick one. I didn't go to anyone's writing school or, you know, learn how to write a successful Amazon. Like that's not, <laughs> that's, I'm not that dude. So uh, for, yeah. for me, the first thing is creating a title. You know, when I write my book, the f if, if I have a title, John, for my next four books that I haven't even started writing yet. So I start with the title first because I want to be able to play everything into the title. And then after I have the title of the book, like my book that's coming out uh, in the end of June is called Game of Death. It's about entrepreneurship. Right. Wow. So once I once I have the title, then I start writing down chapter titles, not not in any order. I just write down what the chapters or titles are going to be. And then I start to write because then I have an outline. And now what I do after I finish writing I might move the chapters around. I might, sometimes the book has come out and the chapters, yeah. the order is pretty much kind of in sync or close. Uh, but so that's what I do for my book writing. I always make sure that I have an idea. I even have the book cover before I start writing. I know everything that's happening before I, I even that. write, right? So yeah. I've, I'm a big visual, I'm really big into visualization. So I know what every cover is going to look like. I do that and then I start to write. When it comes to the podcast, it's funny. People are like, I have two podcasts. One's called Population Unplugged, which is just me speaking. And the other one is called Storytellers Podcast, which I started, you know, during this, you know, Rona stuff where I interview people. So on Population Unplugged, I get on and me and you might have a conversation, John and Marianne, and I say, oh, you know what? That's interesting. And I'll talk about it. Like there's nothing, unless there's something factual that I have to put out there, then I just kind of go, I flow. With the storytellers, now I have to learn about the person because I'm interviewing a guest. So I kind of go through their IG, their Facebook. I kind of stalk them <laughs> without getting a restraining order and figure out like, what are some of the interesting points that I want to throw out there? So that's with the podcast. And then when it comes to the Positivity Summit, 
I just love talking to dope human beings. Like that's my, I, I love talking to dope human beings and I love highlighting people that are whatever society would call under the radar that are doing yeah. phenomenal things. We're so obsessed with celebrities. Like, oh my gosh, Kim Kardashian, and she just spit on the ground. That's amazing. <laughs> and, you, and you have Marianne and John here doing this phenomenal show, right? And being lighthouses. Like, so my, the Positivity Summit was to one, unite people, regardless of race, religion, who you voted for, whatever. And also share that bond that we have, like I said before, in terms of we all gone through some adversity. So then there's, there's that with the podcast. And then with my speaking, I have an idea of what I want to say, maybe stories I want to share, depending on who the audience is. But once I go up there, I do believe that I have divine content. I believe other people, like we all have divine content. Like it just comes through me. Like I can't tell you what I spoke about my last speech. I have no idea. Because once I start to go, I get into a flow. It's like being in basketball it, and getting in the zone. It's almost like the book, right? Like you have the title, you have the overall theme, mm -hmm. and then you get into it and get into that flow and just – Start going. Yeah, okay. I wrote I wrote this last book, guys, in seven days. Wow. wow. Seven days. I just I literally I, I started writing and I felt like Whoopi Goldberg from Ghost. I was possessed. <laughs> I was just like, you know, yeah. I was just started writing and And I that's when you don't want to stop yourself. Yes. That's when you, you do not that's want when to you stop. Don't stop. <laughs> when you're you in your creative your creative mode and, and your juices are flowing. So don't yes. stop. Yeah, I never, I never flow. write when I'm not, when I don't feel it, guys, I don't write. When people yeah. force themselves to write, or that's why I self-publish my books, because I'm not a deadline guy. If you tell me, oh, you have to write by here and be done, I'm not going to give you good work. And I never forget my first book. All my books are short. They're all like 70, 75 pages. My first book, there was a guy in LA that was like, oh, well, why don't you make it 30 more pages? So it's a hundred. I was like, I'm done writing. Yeah. Yeah, write you, another don't, you don't want to force it. You don't want to force yeah. it. Yeah. I'm going to give you fluff. I'm not going to give you 30 pages of fluff. I'm going to give you fire for however many pages it is. And then it's done. And then I'm going to go on to the next thing. So it's so true. When I, whenever I feel it, I write. When I don't feel it, I don't write. That's it. And then, okay, so what was it from your past that led you down this path? Yeah. Um, and I mean, you found avenues, the podcast, the books, um, everything to put that message out there, the summit, the positivity summit. Um, yeah, just a breakdown of what wasn't in your past that kind of built you to where you are today. You kind of talked about certain ages where you hit um, um, basketball um, and had all these different experiences. But what was it from your past that kind of led you down this calling of yours? Yeah. This is the beginning right here, my mom. Moms. And Mary, Marianne, Marianne has heard me speak multiple times. Um, when my dad passed when I was four and my mom raised five of us with no money. So who I am as a human being is really based on like who my mom was and is still to this day. She was just such a solution oriented person. She never lived in problems. And I remember coming home and just having our lights get shut off. And sometimes we wouldn't have food and we'd be the, the family that gets the free turkey, all this stuff. And my mom never putting her head in her hands and giving up. So I just was, I grew up without having any quit in my DNA. And my dad was a police officer and he did all these things for the community, but I only have like two memories of my dad. And one was at his funeral. So I didn't know who my father was. I didn't know his, the, the extent of magnitude of his greatness and all the things he did for other people until I started kind of getting older and doing what I'm doing now. So I discovered basketball very late when I was 16 years old and I sucked. I was God awful. Like I was terrible. Never played ball before in my life. So I had my mom's work ethic. She raised five of us while working three jobs. So basketball provided for me this solitude, this place where if I just put in the time, I knew I could get better. And my whole goal was if I play professional basketball, then my mom never has to struggle again. So that was my thinking. Me and the youngest boy, I was so protective and still so protective of my mom, where I was like, all right, whatever it takes to get this done, I'm going to do it. So eventually I got good enough to get a full scholarship, and then I got a contract to play basketball, professional basketball, and then I got injured right before I was supposed to go. And so then I started coaching basketball. And when I was coaching basketball, I started to realize that motivation is intrinsic, right? Like I can motivate my players in terms of like get them fired up, but that's just a part of motivation. I think motivation is something that is – starts with the self, right? That's why I don't use motivational speaker when I talk because I don't know what you're going to get out of my speech. Yeah. But to inspire young men from inner city places that are in this rural area 
and give them hope, give them dreams, let them know they're not just a statistic. statistic. They can be more than just basketball players. I start, I was being groomed for what I'm doing this whole entire time. And I had no idea, you know, I, I was every aspect of my life going through all my, you know, hard times, all that stuff. They were all just chapters in the story. So by the time I got to this, I had all these chapters, you know, and I started doing this from, it's so funny. I was on Facebook and it was, I was just reading a bunch of negative quotes on my timeline, negative posts on my timeline. I took a book of positive quotes, put a positive quote on there, started doing that every day. People liked it. And then a couple of months later, I lost the book, wrote my own quote. People still liked it. So I was like, screw the book. I'm going to write my own quotes. And then the quotes became blogs and the blogs became books. And when the book first came out, it, I was so in my zone. Like when I first spoke for the first time, I was so in my zone that people were like, man, how long have you been speaking for? I was like, 45 minutes. Like this is my first speech, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I don't know what to tell yeah. you. So I, once you're in your purpose, once you feel, once, you, once you're stepping in what God created you to do, once you're in that moment, it doesn't mean it's seamless. It doesn't mean there's not struggle. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It just means when you're in the freaking act, nothing can stop you. Like, you know, like I go to do speeches. People are like, oh man, there's a couple thousand. I don't care who's there. I don't care. You can bring the freaking president. You can bring, I don't care who's there. I, when I speak, it's not about me. And that's why I tell speakers all the time. It's about your message. If you're worrying about you, that's when you get nervous. I get excited because I'm like, somebody's going to get something from here. And then I go. So it's just been a blessing for me to be able to do what I do every single day and love it. And the, the hardest part of not about this thing is just not being able to do it in front of another human being and hug yeah. that human being and interact with that human being, you know, yeah. so you got to pivot and do it a different way. Well, I mean, since you brought it up, the pandemic and everything that's happened in the last, I don't know, two and a half months since it really hit, how have you, how have you pivoted? I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a phrase that's out there. How have you changed what you're doing? How have you changed what you're, has it impacted your writing? You're obviously voicing a podcast. You can see what the difference might be there, but how have things changed for you and how have you pivoted? Uh, the hardest thing for me is not being on a plane and speaking. Like I, I just got back from Saudi Arabia and Africa a couple of months ago, speaking before this happened. I was supposed to be in Dubai at the end of March. When I got back from Austin, Texas it was March 21st. I was speaking at this event called Humans First. And when I, when I left there, it just started kind of hitting. And the airports were getting a little eerie, you know, not as many people. When I landed, I was supposed to go to Dubai in the next six days. So Dubai shut down completely. So again, on the plane ride home, I was already thinking, you know, your podcast, you have to start being more consistent with your podcast. You're going to start a new podcast. You're going to finish your, your entrepreneur book. You're going to, you know, start. And I, and I started like already having my plan done. So when I hit the, when I hit that, uh, hit Jersey, I got home and my wife was like, you good? Cause I was like, I'm going to go downstairs. Like I cleaned out the whole entire <laughs> office. <laughs> I ordered a green yeah. screen. Like I just started, like, I just started going off and I'm like all the things that I wanted to do that I convinced myself there was no time to do, which there was, I wasn't making time for it. Then now I had no excuse. So I started doing them. <laughs> I think that may be the quickest example I've seen of somebody kind of turn around because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who have taken at the minimum a couple of days or a couple of weeks or even still trying to figure it out. But that, I think that's the quickest example I've seen of somebody just kind of hit the ground running. Yeah. But um, again, it's, it's also background, right? Like I've been, I've come home and had not had food to eat, you know? Yeah. So like when I, when I come home and I'm like, I see my mom do what she did, work miracles. I'm like, okay, this sucks. Don't get me wrong. I never try to minimize what people are going through. Yeah. But for me personally, the stuff that I've been through is way harder than this, you know, like way harder. So I'm, I'm looking at like, I can get, I know I can get through this. You know, I have a roof yeah. over my head. There's people that don't have anything that are out in the streets that don't have a roof over there, that don't have a phone, that don't have family members they can call on. So I'm like, I can't sit there and feel sorry for myself when I know that there's people in Africa where I just came from that this is hitting a lot different. So yeah. I just have the gratitude for what I have. And then I just keep it pushing. It's like always improvising. Yeah. And I, one, one last question on my side, Cornell. Um, what did you go to school for? I went to school. It's funny. <laughs> so every athlete, right? Like not every, I'm not going to generalize. Like 75% of the athletes, you say, what are you majoring in? Business. What type of business? <laughs> I don't know. Right. So like, <laughs> so my first two years of, of school was, business what type of business who knew but then when i was a junior when i went when i was in north dakota 
I fell in love with public relations because of the, the person I was in charge of it, this man by the name of Neil Rogers, Roberts. He made it so interesting for me. So we were doing like interviews and like mock news, like reading off a teleprompter. So I'm like, oh, I get to play. This is just fun. Like I enjoy it. So I changed it to public relations and communications and had like a minor in journalism. Uh, none of the stuff that I'm really using right now, but uh, it made school so much more fun because I wasn't just reading the same terminology term from year to year to year. Yeah. Yeah, but that seems like it contributed a lot to what you're doing now, though, right? I mean, journalism, public relations. Well, not really. Or maybe you're just <laughs> maybe you're just doing it so naturally you don't see it, though. I mean. Yeah, I mean, it has a, it probably has a play in it, but like the journalism was like we break down case studies and writings and stuff. Like now, when I write. If you read my, I write how I talk. So it's yeah. like, I'm, I'm just, I'm a silly dude. So I just you write how I talk. Heart. Yeah, so yeah. it's just like, but, but yeah, for, for sure. Like, even when it comes to conducting an interview now, I used yeah. to have to interview the, co the, the uh, coaches in our college. So that helps for sure. Now when I'm interviewing guests, you know, it's kind of a more of a flow. But okay. I, back then, man, I'm telling you, John, to be honest with you, it was just basketball. You know, they say student athlete. I was an athlete student. Like, okay. I, I was good at school just because I took it seriously because I knew that I needed this to play basketball. You know, and then when I graduated from college and saw so many of my friends that did not have that fallback degree, that didn't have that paper, I was like, man, thank God Mama Thomas raised me right because yeah. I got injured and now – you know, if you don't have a degree, I mean, there's people with masters that can't get jobs. If you don't have a degree, people aren't even going to look at you. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that, that I took that seriously. Yeah, mom taught you that grind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, awesome. she, and she doesn't mess around. I'm still afraid of her. So, yeah. Isn't that amazing how that happens? <laughs> how are we still afraid of our moms? My mom is like a foot and a half shorter than me. She gives me, she gives me a look. It's over. <laughs> That's right. She's five foot two and a quarter. And I, I still, she'll look at me a look of like, Okay, mom, what you, what, what you want me to do, mommy? I'm good. The smaller, <laughs> the mightier. Yeah. You know, I knew Mary I was going to say something. She's like, you don't want to mess don't, with the short Don't folks. underestimate the small um, ones. No underestimation whatsoever. <laughs> all, due, all due respect. All due respect. All due respect. <laughs> so, Cornell, you've talked about um, your podcast, being an author. Do you have just a few more minutes to tell us a little bit about the Positivity Summit? Oh, sure. Sure. So the Positivity Summit, it's uh, May 28th through the 30th is actually next week. And I have 22 presenters. So from all over, I mean, Africa, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Canada, England, Switzerland, at all my travels, I just recruited people to come and share uh, their knowledge. Uh, so it's not a rah-rah. People aren't going to try to sell you stuff. They're just sharing their unique stories who, that have helped make them who they are. And some of these people that, you know, they have humongous uh, followings and backings. They're just normal people. Like it's not, there's no high maintenance person on the roster. We have two musicians that are going to be performing uh, during the event. So I'm excited for that. And uh, there's a, a firefighter in my hometown that lost his life from, from COVID. And we're going to take a portion of the proceeds and put it towards, put it towards his family. No camera, nothing like that. Just walk up to the family and give them a check and say, we hope this can help out a little bit. So they don't even know we're doing it. Like I, my, my, one of my best friends is a firefighter on the force. So when I, when I heard about it, I said, hey, don't tell anybody. Don't put any fanfare. I'm just going to take the check and just walk into the house and say, here you go. That's amazing. Always, always with a big heart, right? Uh, <laughs> do my best. So how is it that you see um, everything that you're doing? How is it going to evolve in the future? Yeah. What does Cornell... I don't know, 2021 or 2030 look like. Oh, he's going to be dope. He's going to be dope. He's going to be doper than this guy for sure. So uh, I have, I'm going to have all these things online and electronically I can do while I go out and speak and touch and interact with, with people. And that's the great thing about the job I was talking about before. That's the great thing about creating and, you know, having all this ammunition now. So now I have, when I have my app and all these things, I can go out and speak and let this stuff just work on its own. Right. So it's only going to make me make what I'm doing better and enhance it. I want to do a global positivity summit where I pick one location. We have people from all over the world come to it. Uh, there's not a, I mean, there's not a place that I don't want to do a summit. I want to go back to Africa. I want to go back to Saudi Arabia. I want to go, you know, uh, do one in Connecticut. So I just want to just spread my story everywhere. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I could keep up with the uh, Cornell of the future. <laughs> Just because 
it just seems from everything you've told me, like it just scales and scales and scales. <laughs> yes, like, it evolves. What, uh, when, when you were telling us the, the story of, you know, getting off the plane, landing in Jersey, running into the house, like mm. this is the first time I'm meeting you right now. And yeah. I actually envisioned <laughs> like, the, like the Tasmanian devil running around the basement, cleaning things up, like just collecting his thoughts. Oh. Uh, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I, that's why I showed you a picture of my mom. It's like, she's, I never take credit for me. You know, I, I never take credit for me because between God and my mom and the people that I interact with, like you amazing human beings and other people, that's who makes me who I am. I get goosebumps saying that. I never take credit like I've learned that I know this or I, I never put myself on guru status or I know everything status. It's, I'm a student every single day, man. And life is my teacher. And that's why every day I'm trying to learn something new. So where, when did that really click for you, that idea? Uh, about eight years ago when I first started doing this, I was, I was so tunnel vision focused, John, in, into basketball. That was my whole identity. This, I thought that was the only reason I was created as a player and as a coach. That's it. When I started doing this, it was the first time that I started getting signs from my father ever in my life, in my life. I mean, I spoke at a place where 250 special, special educators talk about my mom and my dad in Clark, New Jersey. And at the end of it, this guy comes up to me, he's about 60 years old. And he goes, I was one of those kids your father helped get off the street and like gave me a hug, you know, like he they did a, they named the street after my father about eight, nine, uh, seven, eight years ago. And uh, I was there talking to a guy who's an older guy who was one of these street kids. My father helped get off, you know, go the right way. And I said something, he said, brother, I got to stop you right there. I said, what's up? He goes, your father said the exact same thing to me 45 years ago when I was like 12 years old, right here in this very same spot. So it was like almost like my dad was waiting for me to do this, to start t- showing me like, yo, man, I've been here. You know, I've been here. I've been watching. So I like, again, I get goosebumps, man. And uh, just the, my son's six and two years, we, we were talking about our kids before and two years ago, uh, Bryce was sitting. I named Bryce Thomas so he can have the, the initials of my father, Bobby Thomas. And, and me and Bryce were wrestling on the bed, just joking around in the morning uh, as we do. And he looked at me and he goes, uh, he goes, Daddy, I said, uh, what's up, Bryce? He goes, your father would be proud of you. Oof. He said it to me at four. And I'm telling you, John, I was like, even now I say it, I get choked up. Like, I was just waterfalls. And I'm like, where does that come from? I mean, come on, he's four years old. Four you know, years old. Where does that come from? You know, and it's like, I was like, I get it. You know, I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, I get it. And you have kids, you have a one year, four year old. It's like, I get emotional, you know, talking about it because it's like, kids are such a special thing. And when I see people like you and Marianne, like people that have kids that are just great humans, it gives you hope for humanity. You know, you hope ignorant people never breed, but people like, like <laughs> you guys that you meet, you're just yeah. like, man, I'm so glad that John, we told me you, you had kids, man. I immediately lit up inside because I'm like, man, here are two more human beings that are coming into this world that are going to have their head on the right way and, and live life the right way, you know? So that's why I think there's always going to be hope for us. Yeah, I think we all think about how to pass on, not that they have to live in, you know, our, our, our way or exactly how we are, but I think a lot of us think about how we can get that, that vibe going, continue that, that mm. vibe, that energy of, all that positivity, just all that energy you're talking about, all that energy you want to put out there. Hopefully, you know, they see what we're trying to do and they, they build their life in that manner. So it's, uh, it's huge that you bring up kids because right now I think that's a lot of the inspiration that I think we all find is just looking at our kids and they may not know exactly what's going on, but just the energy, the, the untapped energy that they're putting into everything and, and commitment into everything. It's just, mm. it's wonderful to see. So hopefully we'll see. I, hopefully they they're watching you, bro. They're yeah. watching you. Everything. Oh yeah, doing, we talked about that. They're the watching, stuff yeah. they say. Yeah. They're watching. They watch. You. They imitate. Well, yep. they record it and they imitate right yep. in their head. And they then watch they're it. Like, Whoa. They have a different <laughs> level of consciousness consciousness than we do. There's a yeah, different level absolutely. because as we get older, society kind of dims our consciousness. Sometimes our oh, kids yeah. are not. They haven't been like diluted with all this other nonsense that we're diluted with. So it's their, their level of consciousness is different. So they see you, my son has seen me speak before, like, you know, to like a small group of people. And he's just looked at me, same thing. My daughter looked at me like, why are these yeah. people like, looking at daddy, listening yeah. to daddy speak? You know, they're trying to figure it out, you know? So yeah. um, it's, it's a beautiful, man. Like I, like I said, when Marianne says, ask me for anything, I say yes, because I know what the conversation is going to be. And I, anytime I can have conversations with like really good people, I'm like, sign me up, 
You know, they like sign me up because this is what we need. We need this, right? We need this interaction. We need like during this time, find good people around you and have conversations. Not about yeah. what's on the news, not about like who died, like about this. Like what's next? What can we do? How can we help one another? How can we collaborate? That's what's important. Yeah. <clears throat> That that's a great segue to I was going to ask you, is there anything that you would like to say to someone that, you know, maybe out there and just a little stuck or, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, one, the, the most important thing you can do at this time is not compare yourself to someone else. Right. Not compare your struggles to other people's struggles, because if you're looking at like, I can't believe that I'm going through this and this person is like, they seem fine above. You have to want to be really self-reflective with you and you have to figure out where are these thoughts coming from? I always tell people when you have negative thoughts about yourself, you've got to break it down like a long division problem, right? If I have this number, we break it down till we get to the very end and either there's a remainder or there's no remainder, we're at zero. You have to ask yourself why, what, why, where, what, how, where is this coming from? And then once you are honest with yourself, you realize it's BS. You realize it's just something we feed ourselves. Now, if you're going through, like you lost your job, you've, there's many people that have lost their jobs, there's many people that have lost their businesses, et cetera. You have to, at some point, not saying you can't mourn it, but at some point you have to say, what now, right? At some point you got to replace the why me with what now. The why me, like you have to let that out, right? I've been there before, trust me when I say this. But then at some point, you gotta let the what now come in and say, okay, now what is the solution? Because if you don't put any time on the solution, all you're gonna have is the problem. Yeah. And then you just kind of fester in that and it perpetuates itself. Yeah. And right. You just land it, right? Like you can be right. like you can have human emotions. Like I, I, yeah. I love it when these motivational speakers are like it's okay. You can be fine. like no, bro. Like you're human. You can be human. You just can't land it. Like John was saying, like you just can't land it. Yeah. Like if you can't put the covers over your head and say I'm gonna just stay here for a minute because this can be a haunted house up here. This could be a dangerous yeah. place, man. I don't know if you've seen it, but I mean, I've seen Marianne since we're like, we run in the same kind of circles. I've mm -hmm. seen her on um, different groups, different mm -hmm. Zoom groups and whatnot. I don't know if you found this, but throughout this entire pandemic kind of well, situation that we're going through, I've seen a lot of people have just been more vulnerable because it's almost like they realize what they've taken for granted. They have more time to themselves. Everything that's going on behind us when bosses are kind of video conferencing, it's the real us. Mm -hmm. So it's like almost the walls completely completely come down. So I've seen people be more vulnerable. And when you're that vulnerable, you can kind of build from like a more honest core, more honest foundation. So I don't know if you've seen that in your work where people are just more open based on the nature of what we're going through. Yeah, what an amazing point. What an amazing point. And that's so true, right? How many times in the beginning of this, you know how many people probably dressed up for Zoom calls? Now people are like, screw it. Right. Like I'm going to take the mask off and just be who the hell I am. And the problem is, is when you work for someone, when you're working for that, when you're on that hamster wheel, you got to put a mask on to go to work. A lot of times you can't be who you are. Right. So that's the thing with the vulnerability is vulnerability and it's empathy because we're all going through the same thing. Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter who you pray to. We're all going through the same stuff. So there's a different level of empathy. What I hope happens is a different level in understanding in terms of gratitude. It is realizing that job that you really didn't like that much, right? That provided you with some type of income so you can chase after whatever that daydream job is that you do want, right? Like, so I'm grateful, like we were saying, like the homeschooling stuff is hard for sure, but I'm grateful I get to spend all this time with my kids. Yeah. Like I'm not on a plane, like I'm hanging out with my kids. Like they wake up and daddy is there. They wake up, daddy's like, what's up? Let's go do something. Let's go ride bikes. Let's do something. Like that to me has been the biggest blessing. We were at the park yesterday and we were riding around and my son just learned how to ride a bike, right? And so I'm just watching him scoot around it and I'm talking to my wife and I'm just like, this is what we have to make sure to bring with us once everything comes back to normal. We can't forget this. And I think a lot of people immediately are gonna start forgetting the lessons that can be learned from this. Yeah. And I pray to God that we don't because there's so much to learn from it to make us better people as we go on. Absolutely. Well, since you said gratitude, um, we are grateful for you oh, and for taking some time to, you know, to spend with us and to 
drop some nuggets of knowledge <laughs> um, and wisdom. And um, John, any last words? Yeah, Cornell, that was that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to just share your website or where people sure. can find more information about your books, your podcasts, your speaking, the Positivity Summit, anything you can kind of share yeah. with us would be great. Well, just thank you first. Thank you to both of you guys for this. This is a beautiful conversation. This made my day. Uh, so that's the first thing. I get goosebumps saying that because it really did make my day. I had a great conversation before and I have another cool conversation. So this is awesome. Uh, second, um, Cornell-Thomas.com. That's my website. All the information for the Positivity Summit is there. And my two podcasts are Population Unplugged and Storytellers Podcast. Other than that, I'm Cornell Thomas across the board on all social media. I'm not like big brown dude, 34, you know, baller, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're not, because I was Googling that. I was Googling that on the other screen this entire time, but I couldn't find you. But now I know. Now I know. But no, yeah. Cornell, thank you. Thank you for making Thanks, the time. Thank, thank, thank you. you for your message. Thank you for your yeah. work, everything that you're doing. For those of you watching this, thank you so much and tune into the next episode of the uh, Connecticut Creative Collaborative. If you have any information or anybody that you want to share that we can talk to, somebody along the lines of Cornell or somebody that brings a different flair or different vibe to creativity, whatever the work may be, even if you're not sure, reach out to us. Uh, you'll see the information and contact us when we post this, wherever we post it, everywhere we post it. Until then, I'm John Jermillo and this is Marianne Cruz, my partner in crime. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank guys. you. Bye, Cornell. See you guys. <laughs>